Let's start. It's uh, 30 seconds past, so I apologise for the terrible timekeeping. I'll do something about that, don't worry. We'll finish on time, because guess what happens after this? It's the free drinks! So, uh, but nevertheless, don't get too excited. We've got a lot to get through before we get to the free drinks. And what we're going to get to is really excellent. Michelle Ockers is going to talk about learning strategy, but focusing around consolidating shifts in L&D. And I think that's a really great concept of a learning strategy. It's the end point, it's not the beginning point. And she'll talk all about that with lots of illustrations. Michelle's Australian. She's based in Victoria or New South Wales? Where is it? South, it's New, South, Wales, it, South Coast, New South Wales. Yeah, town just, of 2,000 people, beautiful little coastal yeah, village. Yeah, just, just very close to the border. It's, it is lovely. It may drive you mad. How long did it take to, you had to drive to get your hair done? Five hours. I drove two and a half hours two and in a half hours. to get my hair done. There we go. That's <laughs> Australia. People say two and a half hours, ah, nothing. So Michelle started her career in the, in the Australian Royal Air Force. And that's where she kind of cut her teeth on training and logistics and project management. Uh, spool forward, and she was the learning lead. She set up a learning academy in Coca-Cola Amateur in Sydney, which was incredibly successful. After that, she started on her own an organisation which eventually became Learning Uncut in 2019. And her focus has been getting people together to share expertise, to focus on building better strategy, building better learning, building more confident learning, building better quality learning leaders. And it's been a real success story up until now. She's getting more and more traction, more and more people are getting involved. And she runs a podcast called Learning Uncut, which has been a, a kind of thread running through everything she's done, and also a kind of almost an index of what she's done and a commentary on what she's done. So the people in the podcast, you, how many episodes have you done so far? Coming up to five years. I think I'm yeah. around, it's case studies and I'm 200? up to 122 120, case studies, yeah. I think. And, and they're available on the website, Learning Uncut, and they are excellent. They're really good little case studies of practice. So it's not about Michelle pontificating about the world, it's Michelle interviewing people who've done good stuff that she knows about and she shares that. So today we're going to be building a big case around how you put together a really authentic and successful and resilient learning strategy and I'm really looking forward to it. Michelle and I have worked together and I guarantee that you're going to have a great final session before the drinks. Did I mention the drinks? <laughs> Michelle, <laughs> on you go. It's Thank up to you, you. Nigel. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you for your interest in learning strategy. Uh, I've learnt a few things along the way since those days at Coca-Cola Amatol, uh, as have uh, some of the people I've worked with. I've got some videos from some of the organisations, the L&D leaders in those organisations to share with you, sharing their tips and things they've learnt about crafting a really compelling, strong learning strategy. So you'll hear not just from me, but from some of the, the people I've worked with about their real world experience. In 2011, uh, I was engaged by Coca-Cola Amatol, as Nigel says, initially as a consultant to help them shape a learning strategy and set up a technical academy. Their supply chain area had invested really heavily in equipment and systems, and they were very reliant on overseas vendors for training, and they could see this was a huge risk. So they wanted to set up an internal technical academy to be able to build capability uh, without this reliance, particularly on overseas vendors. Uh, so my job was to design it. And I worked for a lovely man called Bruce. He was my two up. Uh, he was a supply chain director. Um, and uh, you know, we got to the end of this two month engagement and the academy was designed and it was ready to be implemented. And the lady inside the organisation who was going to lead the academy got a posting over to Europe. So I was asked to kind of stay on for a little bit longer and help them implement it. And then Bruce started dropping a few hints, the occasional joke about being part of the team. And it kind of got me thinking, you know, I, I sat there one night at home in the backyard with a glass of shardy in my hand thinking, what would it be like to go from designing something as a consultant to working as part of the team and trying to implement it? It'd be kind of a real litmus test of the work I've done here. Is it going to work? You know, does it need adjustment? Um, 
it's exciting, but it's also a little bit risky. Uh, but I decided to go for it and I joined the company where I stayed in the role for four years, uh, leading this academy and evolving the strategy over that time. Um, for the first few years, Bruce was my, my leader, my two up, uh, and then he got a posting to Japan uh, and I went in to see him. He's on the 13th floor of this beautiful uh, office overlooking Sydney Harbour, glass, glass ceilings, uh, glass walls, floor to ceiling. Um, and I sat down in a comfy chair next to him and I said to him, you know, I just wanted to thank you so much for your support while I've been here. We've done some amazing work. We've really fulfilled this vision you had for an academy. Uh, and he looked at me, you know, he leaned forward and he said to me, you know what, Michelle, you make your own luck. And that got me thinking. We learned a few things along the way. Some things worked out, some things didn't work out so well and we had to reshape things. Uh, so my hope is by sharing some of the things I've learned and some of the things that the people I now work with have learned that it puts you in a better position to make your own luck in your own organisations. Um, and with that in mind, we're going to start, as Nigel says, I like to lean into collaboration and get a bit of peer experience exchanged. Uh, we're going to start the conversation by talking about the shifts in learning and development over the past two to three years. Obviously a lot's been changing. Uh, and you've been living it, right, in your organisations, trying to figure out how are things different, what do our organisations need from us now, where are we going to go with learning in the organisation. So what I'd invite you to do is to find a couple of people to talk with. Some of you are a little bit far apart, you might need to just shimmy across. And just speak for a couple of minutes about this question. What shifted in L&D in your organisation in the past two to three years? So from pandemic to present? Yeah. P to P. Yep. Yeah, let's go P to P, pandemic to present. <laughs> okay, I'll get you to wrap up the point you're on at the moment and we'll grab a microphone here. We're just going to share a few examples. I keep forgetting to bring a bell or something like that when I do this, right? I need to pull on that military parade ground voice here, I think. Okay, let's, let's grab some examples from the floor. Um, who's, who'd like to share an example of something that shifted in L&D in your organisation? And we've got a mic here, so we'll run the mic to you. Back there. The mic runners don't have to go to the gym afterwards, do they? Okay, what's your example? Um, so we've shifted quite a lot from purely delivering face-to-face -face pre pandemic to then going fully online and it's taken probably up until this point now for us to understand what method works best and mm. where we can combine the methods so a lot of our learning that's knowledge based is done in a blended way so you do online learning at your own pace and then you bring that into a classroom to do it practically or it can be done virtually through Teams or Zoom or something. So that's something that has really changed over the past couple of years. Yeah, so that whole shift from face to face to online to now kind of trying to figure out what works best and when to use what and how to blend it all. Who else has faced that one? How common? It, yeah, that's a pretty common shift. I'm getting lots in the podcast about organisations talking about that shift. Have we got someone who's got a different example of a shift that they, they're going through? I think one of the shifts we're looking at at the moment is how we are structured within uh, learning development the HR side and in with all the buzzwords of agile and all this stuff and actually the comp or the area that I work in is probably looking at trying to revert the homeostasis back to a more traditional model that we're no longer geared up to provide so the strategies that we have in place to drive forwards isn't always completely understood by the end user so we're kind of trying to figure out how to get everyone on board with more limited resources that may not always understand where we're coming from for, for the why it's of benefit to them to get on board with, with the way we're structured. Yeah, and this link between strategy and how do you structure yourself both within L&D and then the network of people that you need to work with who are part of delivering learning, facilitating learning, enabling learning in the organisation. Who else is going through shifts in org structure and in their L&D function and thinking, how do we best position ourselves 
Yeah, that's a pretty common one. That's a pretty perpetual one, isn't it? We're always playing with that and trying to get that right. Maybe one more example. We've got one over here. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I noticed in, in ours there was a huge increase in spending on L&D uh, as sort of the pandemic hit and they realized that they couldn't do face-to-face -face and they needed a new strategy. So I think the L&D team but the last two, three years has more than doubled. Wow, yeah. Who's seen more investment in L&D in the past two to three years? It's a bit of a mixed bag, this one. Yes, not, not everybody has. It's, it's very patchy, it's very inconsistent, I think. Um, and some of these shifts are, are very much the stuff we're reading about in the industry reports, for those of you who keep up with some of these industry reports, you know, we saw that, I don't know if any of you remember the Fosway research that they did um, in 2020, how COVID-19 is changing learning and this big rush to online learning. Uh, and for the first time, for many L&D leaders, the opportunity to make changes that they'd wanted to make for a long time. So it was a big shift there. Uh, and then more recently, um, you've got the Mind Tools for Business reports. They do some really interesting reports where they draw not only from L&D, but also from learners through the learner intelligence work they use in organisations and business leaders. Uh, and a really telling report, which I think is still um, pertinent today, is the one they did, I think, in 2021. Same team, different sides which was looking at perspectives of business leaders and what business leaders were wanting from L&D and what L&D thought they were there to do. But I think one of the more interesting pieces of research has been the LinkedIn Workplace Learning Report over the past two years, talking about L&D becoming more strategic, more central, being asked to solve more strategic business problems. Have people found that? Just a show of hands. Do you, do you, is your sense that uh, there is a, a sense of more strategic value to be added by L&D? Yeah. So now is a great time to be really thinking and working strategically, thinking and working business first and thinking about business value. And some of that plays into the why should you really sit back and look at what should our strategy be? And we're going to talk in a moment about well, what the hell is a learning strategy anyway, but how, how should we be working? What, how do we bring value to the organisation and offer learning in a way that people find really helpful and really compelling? Because at the end of the day, you don't want to have to push this stuff on people. You know, if you, if, you, if you can understand what people really need, what they're trying to get done in their jobs, what's going to really help them, it's going to make sense to them and they're going to want to engage with it. So that's the kind of path we're going to go down here as we start looking at uh, learning strategy. Now, I'm going, I've got a little montage here, several of my um, clients that I've worked with talking about, well, what is a learning strategy? What are you trying to do with your learning strategy? So we're going to watch that for about two minutes of them speaking. Organisational learning strategies are very much where I'm focused. And what those are about is helping the organisation to actually achieve its business goals and the things it wants to do uh, alongside its big vision and its big strategy uh, through learning, through sharing, through knowledge building, capability, enablement, any of these other wonderful things. So what a learning strategy is to me is really our opportunity to connect to the business strategy as a learning function, making sure that we're supporting our people, what are the capabilities required in order to execute on business strategy, making sure that the, the priorities of the business are aligned with what we're doing as a function. And I think the learning strategy and what I've definitely seen so far is that opportunity to have a different conversation with the business and to make sure that we're not as a function operating separate to business strategy that we are in lockstep with the business or our people and culture strategy, whatever that is, making sure that what we're doing, our resources, our time, our investment is going towards the right, right things in the business. I think it's important to have a learning strategy because it provides you with a really clear map of where you want to go and how you're going to get there. The learning strategy really set out um, really set out the the kind of the guideposts to improve the system of learning and development in the public service and really clarified uh, individuals and organizations responsibility in order to achieve the the strategy objectives having a learning strategy for us has been so important and so critical because we really can't do any of the um, innovative, visionary stuff that we want to do for New Zealand without learning anything new. You can't change how things are or um, how they're going to be in the future if you're not 
constantly picking things up, improving, and that's learning at its very base. So it's been really critical. I love that last point from Zoe Freeman at Wakakatahi New Zealand Transport Agency. Nigel and I both have had the pleasure of working with them over a number of years. You know, if learning isn't about innovation, then what is it? You know, if it's not about being able to adapt, be agile, do something different, I mean, that's the whole point of learning at the end of the day. Um, and uh, we'll hear a little bit more from Zoe and also from Greg, who you saw there. Uh, on some of their experiences. So just trying to bring some of the voice of people that I've worked with and not just my own voice telling you how it should be, but um, what, are, what are people seeing as they start working with learning strategy? I do have a recent podcast episode from Di Hickman, who you saw there, um, from the Australian Public Service. That was out a couple of weeks ago. Um, and for those of you, I've got some guides here where the, the, we've taken extracts from the Australian Public Service um, learning strategy to illustrate what goes into a learning strategy. So if you'd like to take a little bit more at um, a little bit more of a look at what they've done there and how they're getting traction 20 months on, Di talks in the podcast episode about that. So here's what we're going to talk about today. Just a little bit of fundamentals around here's some common traps you don't want to fall into and how to avoid them. Then we're going to talk about how do you really understand what the organisation and its people need. Um, then we're going to look at this idea of a value proposition. Who went to the AstraZeneca session with Mark Howes earlier today? Yeah, so value, he talked about value proposition, right? He talked about governance, he talked about buy-in. So some of that you'll see illustrated in the examples I'm going to use today as well. It resonated quite heavily um, with uh, some of the work I've done with my clients. And then crafting your organisational strategy to deliver on this, and then the all-important buy-in, which of course you shape along the way. You don't try to market it in at the end. It's in the way you shape your learning strategy that you generate buy-in along the way. Uh, so let's start with common strategy pitfalls. Um, there's five that I've, ide I've identified here. I'm going to tell you a story, a real world story, about an organisation and how it shaped its learning strategy. And I want you to see how many of these pitfalls you can identify that they fell into. And if you've fallen into these pitfalls yourself, that's OK. We've all done one or two of these in our time. Um, so in 2018, I was asked to review the learning strategy uh, which had been developed for an organisation by a consulting organisation. And the HR manager approached me and said, look, we've got this learning strategy and it kind of looks nice on paper, but we really don't know if it's right for our organisation. Can you come and take a look at it for us? We don't know if it's going to work. Uh, and I asked her, how was it developed? And she said, well, we had a two-day workshop and we got all of our L&D team and our HR team together in a room for two days and the consultants ran the workshop for us and what they did was they gave us six things we had to make choices about. Um, and by way of example, one of those was the extent to which learning uh, was adapted to the characteristics of the learner, so basically personalisation. And then they said, OK, for each of these six key things, we're going to give you five choices and you have to decide where you want it. It's almost like, you know, a board with five scales and where do you want to put them? So for the personalisation one, it's like, is it one size fits all or is it fully individually personalised? Where do you want to sit on that scale? Um, none of those options were customised for the organisation. It was all generic. And what they ended up with was something that was really, could have belonged to any organisation, basically. Uh, you know, you could have picked it up and plugged it in just about anywhere. Uh, so when you think about that, just uh, which of these do you, strategy pitfalls do you think that they'd fallen into in this case? Anyone want to give me one or two? Outsourcing? Yeah. The trap with that, if you let someone else create your strategy for you, it's all right to get help. It's not okay to abrogate it because you really miss this incredible opportunity to deepen your understanding of the business, to have some great conversations and build relationships with your business and to really understand the reality of how it is on the ground for your people. If you're not the one having those conversations, that's really important. Um, another one, perhaps? Copying someone else's, yeah, it wasn't quite that they picked it up and grabbed it. And you know, you can find examples of learning strategies out in the public domain. The Australian Public Service one is in the public domain, for instance. You can actually, you know, search for that and find it. Um, and even if the words sound the same, 
Like they talk about building a learning culture and who doesn't want to build a learning culture or build a self-directed learning organisation? But what that looks like for your organisation might be different. Your context is different. So you really do have to go through the effort of looking at your organisation and what it needs and not just picking up and using someone else's. And of course this whole dear idea of being in your ivory tower and not getting out and talking. If you're creating a learning strategy and it's predominantly L&D and HR in a room together, then you're really not getting any external voice into the room to look at what should the learning strategy look like. So a lot of these um, challenges are born of our very human bias to action, right? We want to move pretty quickly. Uh, so when we move too quickly, when we think too shallowly, when we consult too narrowly, we're going to fall into some of these traps. So in terms of avoiding these traps, uh, two, two things to keep in mind. One is to have some good solid principles in place. Um, and there is, we've got nine principles we work with. You see three of these here. And what you see is a lot of it starts with understanding your organisation, starting business first, uh, co-creation and thinking about evidence. What evidence do we have to build the case for change as to what's happening now? What evidence can we draw on to help us shape the future? Uh, so you can actually go on our website, Learning Uncut, we've got a resources page. There's a strategy checklist there. If you're interested, you can download it. And then building those principles into a really solid process. Uh, so we're going to touch on some of these stages of the process that we use when we're shaping learning strategy. But the temptation is goes to go straight to two, to strategize, to figure out what should the strategy be without spending enough time up front doing the, the sanity checking, if you like, understanding, doing some research, gathering some evidence about what does it look like on the ground right now. Uh, so, as we move through the rest of the session, we'll get a glimpse of what some of those activities look like. So let's start with understanding what your organisation needs, which is the diagnose phase. So in this phase, you're really trying to get um, a solid understanding of what things look like on the ground right now. Um, you're trying to understand your industry context. You're trying to understand your organisation and its strategy and what makes the organisation profitable, competitive, where they're leaning into for the future. You're trying to understand um, the experience of your people right now, uh, their work context, what matters to them, what they're trying to get done what they're finding helpful and not helpful in their work and with learning. And then you're trying to step back and take a bit of a look at your own practices uh, and to do some benchmarking to understand what are the best um, performing organisations, L&D organisations doing that's different. So we look at, we've got six areas of research in these, uh, sort of grouped in these ways that we do research on internally and externally and we ask the L&D team themselves to do the research. The, the approach we take is to guide them through it, looking at these six different areas. So here's an example for you. This is from um, a global manufacturing organisation, um, Orica, actually. You saw Greg, the L&D leader, talk before. Uh, so this is what we call our evidence matrix. So we ask the question, what internal and external evidence should you be drawing on and thinking about as you seek to understand how things are at the moment and how things might be into the future? And we look at qualitative and quantitative evidence. Uh, so in this case, I'm just gonna make sure I, I keep on track here. Um, in this case, the organisation had changed its business strategy. So there was an opportunity to look afresh with a new business strategy at learning strategy and how is learning helping the organisation there was a really strong desire from the L&D leader and the L&D team to increase business impact and they knew they had some service delivery challenges which we'll touch on in a moment that they wanted to address. They had this sense that their senior leadership was increasingly open uh, because of some of the shifts that had happened with them as well during the pandemic but also because they were investing in a new business strategy and they were going into some new areas um, where they needed to build competitive advantage. So uh, they, they manufacture and provide mine blasting services around the globe, but they were also going into digital services. So there's some new skills they need to bring into the organisation and build. Even with this sense that there was going to be support, they had to build the case for change. And the way they built the case for change was through the diagnose phase and doing their thinking and research. So on the right side where you see this evidence matrix, um, just a couple of examples of some of the things that they did. Uh, in the top left there, the qualitative research, 
uh, we leaned heavily into human-centred discovery. So we did, for instance, 11 senior leader interviews. We did 12 focus groups with 19 team leaders and 32 team members from around the world. We talked to people in Africa, we talked to people in Mongolia, we talked to people in North America to really understand the experience they were having um, and how well learning was serving them. Uh, another example that sits in the bottom right there, I talked about benchmarking before. We got them to use the learning performance benchmark. Are people familiar with the Mind Tools for Business learning performance benchmark? It used to be towards maturity health check. It's a really great piece of benchmarking which you can do for free. So if you haven't used it before, I'd encourage you to take a look at that benchmark. It's a really great way of looking at your own practices, your skill set and your learning ecosystem. So we looked at all of these things and then we brought that together. We bring the, the thinking together or what the findings together in two key ways. The first is by doing a SWOT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. Um, this is an example of some of the items from their SWOT. It's not the complete SWOT. There was a lot more in there. Um, so when we do a SWOT for learning and development, what we look at, we treat the strengths and weaknesses as things that your L&D team has a high level of control over. So it's often those your own practices, your own structure, um, the learning tech ecosystem to the extent that you're able to control and shape it. The threats and opportunities come from outside of the L&D team. They could be inside the organisation, uh, but they're things that you have to either accept and figure out how to work with or that you can try to influence, but you don't have as much control over them. So for example, here with Orica, the strengths included pockets of good practice in their regional L&D teams around the globe, but a weakness that needed to be addressed is that not many of their learning solutions, despite being a global organisation, not many of their learning solutions were actually designed for global use. They were doing a lot of it locally or developing them in Australia and then someone was trying to pick it up and adjust it to another location. Uh, so what this was leading to, a lot of duplication, a lot of issues with translation and access um, and fragmentation of content. One threat that was identified was that They'd made this big shift from face-to-face -to, -face to online learning, but they have a lot of deskless workers, right? A lot of people who are mining, mining in, working in mines and, and out there doing physical work. Um, and over time, they, they felt that the development opportunities they'd offered weren't working for them, and indeed they felt that the development opportunities were below par for their sector. They could see they're working on site, you know, with Rio Tinto or BHP or some of these other big mining organisations, and they're looking at the people they work with and going, they're getting much better development opportunities than we are. What's this about? Why would I want to stay here? You know, and one of their senior leaders spoke about being in a war for talent. If you're in a war for talent, you don't want your people thinking that way. One of the opportunities, though, was that they discovered to their surprise that their people have a huge appetite for learning. And there was a stack of informal learning going on because people were coaching and supporting each other in the absence of content in particular. So if you lay out your findings in a SWOT, it gives you the opportunity to pattern make, right? To step back and go, what's working well? What's not working so well? How do we put this together? The second thing that we do is create a research summary. Um, and we do it in a way that speaks to the business in particular. So, the idea here is to go beyond just looking at these separate fragmented categories that we're researching and ask the so what question. So what does this mean for the business? Um, and we create an executive summary. So we do have a summary of each of those six research categories we talked about before, which is really important. But then we lift it up and we say, okay, if we're gonna present this to build a case for change back to our executive team, what do we wanna tell them about both the, the, the stuff where we're having a positive impact, but some of the areas where we perhaps are placing the organisation at risk because of the way we're approaching learning, because of the investment in learning. Um, so we ask those questions. And as you can see here, uh, the business implications, when you look at this, this is some of the statements that were put in their executive summary. They talk business first, right? They talk about performance. They talk about competitive advantage. There were some statements in there around safety. Uh, the, the organisational alignment was really important because their business structure and where dollars are held is really fragmented. It makes it really hard to tackle some of the problems they needed to tackle with this fragmentation, for instance. 
so it's, it's a really valuable way to challenge yourself and this is actually much harder to do than you might think as an L&D person. Much harder. This is one of the most challenging pieces of this whole process that I have to coach the L&D leaders through is to really think business first and express the value and impact of their work in business language. So Nigel, I wanted to do a check in with you at this stage in terms of this kind of approach of going out and actually taking the time to listen, to look, and then think, doing that thinking around, well, what does this mean for the business and trying to express it back. What are your thoughts? What do you see uh, when you work with organisations around how they tackle this? Uh, can you? Thank you. Uh, I had two things. The first is that I think that L&D does not generally do enough field work. Yeah. I call that field work. Mm. And if you don't do field work, you're then reliant on people to mediate for you and say, oh, this is the problem, this is what you need to do, these are the places where you need to spend your, spend your time and attention. And almost invariably, every single one of those is wrong. Yeah. So I, I, I think people ought to do field work, not just once off for a, for, a, uh, for a learning strategy, but that should be a regular part of their job. Never take it on first value, face value, go and see it for yourself and interrogate, you know, just get below the surface. Because often what appears to be the problem is not the problem at all. Field work, it's really important. I agree with you entirely. Yeah, very true. Um, anyone who was in the AstraZeneca session, one of the lessons coming out of that from Mark Howes was sometimes you've got to go slow to go fast. Yes, yes. There is a tendency to skim this phase, right? There's a tendency to want to go, we think we know what's needed. We've seen some other stuff somewhere else that we think is going to work really well. We know our learners. You'd be surprised at how much we're blinkered to and when we really ask and really look, how much we can discover. Uh, so I'd encourage you, if you're thinking about developing a learning strategy or refreshing your learning strategy, take the time with your research and to really get out into the business and to talk to people and listen and test your thinking back. We're gonna talk in a moment about some of the human-centered design approaches because that's very much around testing back with people, developing empathy with people around their experiences in the area we're trying to provide services, which in this case is enabling learning, of course. Uh, so we draw on these insights from the diagnose phase and we take them forward into the strategize phase. Um, and in this phase, we're shaping a learning strategy, but as part of doing that, there's this really important step that I encourage everyone to go through, which is to prepare a value proposition for each stakeholder group. Um, we're going to focus on this activity in particular as we look at this, this phase of how do you shape up your learning strategy. So the value proposition I truly believe is like the secret source of creating a really solid strategy and designing the range of services you're going to offer, the learning approaches, how you're going to enable learning, not just you know, which programs are we, are we going to deliver and what learning methods are we going to use, but just thinking of yourself as a service provider more generally and what are people going to provide, find really useful. So this is where you start thinking what's going to be truly compelling, truly useful, truly valuable to people, and they'll look at it and they'll go, that makes so much sense, that's going to be really helpful. So that's what the value proposition does for you. And it's really just a really short statement of how learning can help different stakeholder groups in to do things that are important to them and in their words. Uh, so it's not something you just make up. It's not marketing, um, although it is a promise and it is part of your brand promise, right? And if you think about it, um, it is something that companies use all the time to sell products and services, right? But as soon as you engage with a product or service, if it doesn't live up to the brand promise, it's a real turn off, right? So it has to be something you are working to deliver on. So it's not just a promise you make to your stakeholders, it becomes a set of design requirements for your strategy. And it's a way of testing back, is this strategy going to be able to deliver on these promises we've made to our stakeholders? Will it help them to do things that are important to them that we've understood in ways that they're going to find valuable? So let's take a closer look at this idea of a value proposition and shaping a value proposition. Um, it really helps you to look firstly, you start with what are people trying to get done in their work and their career development. You don't start by asking questions about learning um, because you are shaping something that's going to help them to get stuff done. 
um, either today with their work or into the future for their career development. And then you're asking yourself, what are the friction points? What are the pain points? What gets in the way of them getting that done? Is it that they're super busy, which we know everyone's going to come back and say, I'm really busy and it's hard to make time to build my skills and shape my career. Um, you're also asking what would real gains look like? What would real wins look like? Well, something that was easy to access would be a real win for me. Something that helps me to be able to um, evidence my skills to position me well for future uh, job, job roles, for instance, or to um, apply for new job roles might be another option. Um, so once you've gotten really clear on what they're trying to get done, what's important to them, you can then ask the question, well, what approaches might be really helpful to them? What sort of services, what support mechanisms could we provide that they're going to find super helpful and valuable in a way that works for them? So the value pro propositions are developed on the basis of personas. Who works with personas for solution design? You can create personas for all sorts of things in HR, right? Including your learning strategy. So you take your human-centered design research, you shape a persona for each stakeholder group, and you test it. You go back to people from those stakeholder groups and you ask them, have we understood your world? Have we understood your experiences with work? Have we understood your experiences with learning? Um, you know, have, have we got this right? And then you shape your value proposition off that and then you test it back again. Is this something you'd like to be able to say about how learning can help you? Are these words you would use? Um, you know, does this sound right to you? Uh, and you'd be amazed at what you get back out of that and the fine tuning that you can do to your understanding of um, what matters to people. So what we're going to do next is we're going to hear about the benefit of a value proposition from Greg, the uh, How manager. How has creating a value proposition Orica. helped you to develop your strategy? Yeah, so for a value propositions, I found it really valuable to go through them. Orica is a, a very diverse business with a lot of different types of people and different employee types and almost um, multiple different businesses within our business. So for me, that process, stepping through what are those different people, what are their unique needs, what are the challenges that they might face, and, and some of it for us is about location, proximity to an office, um, connection issues, language issues, all of those pieces. There is a lot that was common amongst our personas that we drew up, um, but there are worse and really different motivators and also challenges in those people that it just keeps them at the centre of what we're doing, of ultimately who we're here to really support in the work. Keeping people that you're there to support at the centre. I hate the word learners, but there's no easy, elegant alternative, right? Um, for the word learners, and I often talk about the people we're here to serve, and we got to we have to think of them as you know the end the end game is we want to support them, and we want to do it in a way that meets our organisation's needs. So um, value propositions help you to do that. So in order to create a learning strategy that is attractive to all of your different stakeholder groups, you need to create more than one value proposition, and then of course you're looking for the threads through that. What's common? What might need to be different? And sometimes you need to offer things in different ways to different groups, right, for that to be really valuable to them. Uh, so I always recommend at least three personas and value propositions. Your senior leaders, your team leader and your team member. I'm going to give you an example of one of those for um, senior leaders and team members in a moment. Sometimes you need more than that because you've got uh, there's variance within a different group, particularly if you look at um, organisations where you have both uh, a deskless or frontline workforce as well as office workers. Sometimes you have to create more than one persona and value proposition for your team members, for instance. But I've never seen it being necessary to do more than five. The other interesting thought is if you've got a really large organisation with decentralised L&D and you're the global or central L&D team trying to work on learning strategy, which was the case with the Australian Public Service, um, you can create a persona and value proposition for all of your dispersed L&D teams as well. Why would they want to buy in? Because often you don't have authority over them, so you can't make them do things, but for the whole thing to hang together across the organisation. We did this with the Australian Public Service, 150 different agencies. Um, so we had to think about, from a change management perspective and buy-in, the L&D teams were part of the buy-in right to make it work. 
Uh, so let's have a look at a couple of examples, again for Orica. The first one is the senior leader value proposition. Um, and this is really about overall business performance and growth. That senior leader group, apart from needing ongoing development themselves, really hold the space for the business strategy in most cases. In this instance, you can see that safety first is really paramount because of the type of sector that we're talking about, but maintaining strong performance and because of where they were at with so many new services, they needed to maintain competitive advantage in traditional services, but they were also really concerned about how do we build capability to ensure we can um, gain competitive advantage in some of these new areas that we're going into. Uh, and of course, the whole talent and, and skills area, it's real. Um, I haven't worked with an organisation in a year and a half who said we don't have an issue with attracting talent and we haven't had to shift our strategies to skill building. Frontline workers, cast your mind back to the SWOT that I shared earlier and I mentioned that people in this organisation are highly motivated to learn but they think that their development opportunities have fallen below those of um, particularly the customer organisations that they're working with in the sector. So this value proposition statement really taps into sense of um, regaining a sense of pride in being uh, you know, an operator for the company and it also links back to their employee value proposition. Who's been, had work done on their employee value proposition in the last year? Um, you know, a lot of companies are working on that at the moment too, so you can look to link your work and align it to that as well. Don't be fooled by how simple these statements appear. You know, a lot of thinking goes into them uh, and we actually create kind of a value proposition canvas, which we've built off the back of Strategizer. I don't know if anyone's come across the work of Strategizer. They have a business value proposition canvas. We've adapted it to look at um, using it in the context of learning strategy. Uh, so I think, what are we at? 4.36. We've got time, if there's any questions right now, we've got time at the end for questions, but I've covered a couple of really big chunks there, right, with the research and the value proposition. Um, are there any questions from the floor at this point before we move on around either the, the research phase or value propositions and how we can use those? We're, um, so I work for a federated charity, we're quite large, so we've got staff and volunteers across the work that we do. And we've got three very clear audiences, all of quite a size. So would we consider making multiple value propositions for each of those three audiences, or would that be too many? Yeah, um, so what I always say to people when they're working on the personas and value propositions is start with uh, one to cover all three audiences, and if you start seeing variance, as you start shaping up your personas and value proposition, and there's something really different we can't accommodate in a way that people will still look at it and recognise it as really helpful to them, then start splitting out. Because the more you split out, the harder it gets to kind of look at what's the common threads, right? Yeah, yeah. I think we had a question towards the back. We'll take one more at this point. Thank you very much. Fascinating. Um, the question of key performance indicators crops in somewhere in this, and I notice at this point you've not talked about key performance indicators, but working for commercial organisations that are bonused and incentivised on uh, reward, do we need to think about that language in our value prop, or is it too soon to start thinking in that way? Um, you should be looking at what your incentives are, what behaviours are, um, are your KPIs and your incentive programs encouraging as, as you do your research, that would be consideration there. But as part of sustaining, and you'll see the fourth phase is sustaining your learning strategy, we get um, uh, the organisation to create uh, what we call a success metric for the strategy. And um, if you're going to be in San Diego on the 23rd of May, you can come to my session around success metrics for L&D. Uh, but it starts with thinking, again, business first. So how are we going to know if this strategy is successful, uh, this learning strategy? And, and we start by looking at, well, what are some key business goals that are in your business strategy? Um, what are the um, indicators or metrics that business is using to measure those? Uh, and in order to be contributing to them, what's in our learning strategy and how are we going to measure that? Yep. So you're looking for kind of a reasonable line of sight. And one of the things Nigel and I uh, have done when we've worked on learning culture is talked about roughly reasonable data and negotiating that with your organisation 
and say, you know, if we're kind of hitting these metrics in learning or if we're do achieving these things, we, we think it's reasonable to say that that's going to contribute to these business goals. Um, do you agree, business? Uh, and we're going to talk in a, when we talk about buy and we're going to talk about advisory boards and governance boards and they help you hold the space to be checking in around your metrics and are we heading in the right track or not? Do we need to reshape something? But yeah, important question. Okay, so let's talk briefly about crafting your learning strategy to deliver on this. And I am only going to do this briefly because there's a fair, more inf a fair amount more information in this guide. There's some extra guides around the place on chairs if you want to pick up one. Or you can go to the Learning Uncut website and this is, I think, the first resource on the resources page if you wanted to download it. And it's got a whole heap more about what goes into your learning strategy with examples. Um, so if you've done your research, if you've taken this human-centred approach to really understanding uh, both your business and your different stakeholder groups, um, you're positioned to craft a learning strategy that is really well informed by what is really needed uh, and that you can test against the question of is this delivering what the organisation really needs or will it deliver what the organisation really needs um, and what our people need and expect uh, from learning. Um, so these are the elements that we work with. We used to work with nine, we're back to eight I think, I think there's eight there. These are the elements that we um, build into each learning strategy. Uh, and we use a strategy on a page format, we develop a more detailed strategy and an action plan around that. Uh, I'm happy to take some questions if there's any of these elements you want to explore at the end of the session, or you can dig in on the, um, through the, the guidebook if you want to take a closer look at these. So touch on that bit very briefly and let's talk about the all important buy-in topic. What's the point in having a beautiful learning strategy that you think is great if no one else believes in it? I once worked at American Express. I had a couple of years working um, in the area that did card personalisation, printed statements, uh, processed cheque payments back in the days when people used to pay for things by cheque. That's dating me. Um, and we worked with a great organisation on change management and there was this magic little formula that I remember, it's just so useful, uh, it's almost like a mental model, um, that the, the quality of outcome on a change is dependent on the quality of the solution and the extent of buy-in. So you could have a, a 9 out of 10 quality of solution but if you've got a 2 out of 10 buy-in, you've got an 18. You know, if you have a 7 out of 10 solution but you've got a 9 out of 10 buy-in, your results are going to be much better. So buy-in is super critical. And if you're taking this approach of creating the, your strategy with consultation throughout, um, with checking back in, we think this is what we've heard, we, this is what we're going to design the learning strategy against, this is what we think it needs to deliver, you should be generating buy-in on the way. It should feel like a strategy developed with the organisation for the organisation with some sense of shared responsibility. It shouldn't be something you're trying to thrust and market back to the organisation. So that's all embedded in the principles that we use to approach creating a learning strategy. So we're going to do another little breakout thing here, a little conversation. Uh, and it may be that you've picked up some things from the examples I've shared today. Um, and some of the things I've learned along the way, or even from your own experience. And it might be your experience getting buy-in on something other than learning strategy and what works. So the question is, what could you do to ensure strong buy-in to your learning strategy? And we'll take a, a, maybe three minutes to talk about that in um, your small groups again. Okay, let's take some input on this question around what could you do to ensure strong buy-in to your learning strategy. We've got our mic again. Hello. <laughs> okay, we're good to go. Uh, who'd like to give me a suggestion around what could you do to ensure strong buy-in to your learning strategy? People are getting shy. You're not going for drinks until I get some suggestions, you know. Oh, here we go. Mike for us. Yeah, so I've done that over a six to nine month period. So they own the strategy. Which what what is it that you've done? I've let them decide what will enable them to be better performance. So based on the performance as opposed to training for training. Yep. Yeah. And this is um this is a workplace and non L and D team? Uh, so we're in defence. Yep. 
Yeah, so L&D is a theme that runs through everything we do because yeah, we deliver to defence. Of um, course. Yeah. So it's getting them, giving them a voice. Empowering. To use, yeah. Empowering them. And creating the agility so they can future horizon scan um, because they know their area is better than I do. Yeah, great. Thank you. You've got one over here on this side of the room. Hi, Michelle. Uh, Brian Murphy from Microsoft. Uh, Ooh, good to see you in Brian. person. Yes. Good to see you in person rather than on a, on a Teams call. That's Teams, not Zoom. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> always be selling, right? I work for our sales organization. But anyway, um, I love this. I, I think we were chatting here about uh, the, the strong uh, buy in. I think there was two things that, that came up somewhat linked. One was further up your your uh, the steps you have uh, doing the work at the beginning you know in terms of really understanding the needs of the business that seems to me the best way to achieve buy-in right because uh, at that stage you're coming to coming full circle right on that work so that would be the first thing and then quick uh, sort of personal experience of doing this at AstraZeneca I know Mark was speaking earlier today um, you know the, the business strategy was growth to innovation or, and is growth to innovation so linking the learning strategy inherent it just becomes it's not even a debate right it just becomes fundamental to executing and delivering against the business strategy for patients so I think these are two um, two principles we were talking about here yeah and sometimes you get a business strategy or a set of company values that make your job a little bit easier right uh, so it, you know um, Novartis and the company value of curiosity well, that's like a gift in learning, right? That's a gift to hang your hat on and growth and innovation. Um, but finding the words that echo, particularly when you're looking at um, talking with your business leaders, uh, finding words they're familiar with. This is why it's so important to test your language back with different stakeholder groups. What's the language they use? Talk to them in language they use, not our language, yeah? And maybe one more, if we've got one more suggestion. Over on the right. Oh, no, sorry. I won't make you run. Uh, did, you, did you have a hand up over here? No? Okay, over on the right. Do I have another bidder? <laughs> I think one of the reflections of this is where we've historically done um, co-produced learning strategies about trying to think why they haven't quite landed and even they've done with focus groups, workshops. I'm thinking actually we have a as, you know, talked about you know being a learning organisation. It's seen from the top and it's resource, but it still dies somewhere because people feel they're too busy to do. So, just that's something probably more reflection. Actually, why is a, a co-produced and co-delivered strategy still not delivering what it should do? Yeah. And how to recognise when it actually doesn't? What's 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 the why is the sometimes the line manager not the facilitator and the enabler to actually get this to work? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I spoke recently, I did um, a one-on-one -on -one health check session um, with someone who told me, well, we have a strategy that's fully aligned to our business strategy, but then she'd also told me, not everyone shares our vision for learning in the organisation and we're having a little bit of trouble getting traction on our learning strategy. And I said, well, tell me about how you aligned your learning strategy, your business strategy. And it was one of these big organisations where things get cascaded down. And, you know, we have the, 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 the global strategy and then everybody gets goals and it's cascaded all the way down. Um, and so our learning team got in a room together again, the room together, um, and we took the business strategy and we translated that into our learning strategy. And they, did, they didn't co-create, right? They didn't invite others in to have that conversation. They felt that it was enough to cascade down, but cascaded goals alone aren't enough because this is about ways of working and ways of learning, ways of improving performance. So here's the super smart Zoe Freeman back to talk to us again. Um, and one of the things we've heard about is um, aligning with your senior leaders. Uh, it's only part of the alignment that you need, but it's a really critical and important part to get your senior leaders on board. Um, one of the things that Waka Katahi did was set up a learning advisory board. Um, there's some really interesting perspectives in this little takeout from Zoe about how to do that uh, in a way that equips uh, the members of that, your senior leaders who are members of that, to be great champions and adds value to them. So listen out to this one. 
What we needed is we needed a group of senior leaders who are as invested in learning and what learning could do for the organization as all of that other stuff. So we went and sought a very specific um, skill set out of our group leadership team. So those are the people that sit right up with executive members. They, they form the direction and the strategic direction for their business groups. And we invited them to come and join. And we made sure that it wasn't just a, you're coming to help us, but also a, there's something you can learn from this and develop yourself as well as we go. Uh, a practice for being on a future board, um, an ability to step up and present in front of their peers, all kinds of other different bits and pieces. Um, we combined that with making sure that our, our papers and stuff were really interesting, not just important and impactful, but really interesting and through um, new information at them and, and interesting things for them to get, take part in. Um, and that then enabled them to be able to go back out um, so not to provide us advice when they came to us and we went to them with with problems, but also to go back out to their business groups and within their own strategic direction and their own leadership, be able to put out that kind of learning message without it seeming inauthentic because it wasn't, they were genuinely, genuinely on board. Sometimes you have to shift people's perspectives of what learning looks like and the potential of learning. So this idea of making it interesting, bringing new ideas in, bringing examples from other organisations, I think there's real value to think about there. You're not just going to, to, to get decisions made. Um, you know, there's this opportunity to expose your leaders to new ideas, uh, to stories about success from elsewhere. So if, if you'd like to get some more exposure, um, to kind of some of these ideas around not just learning strategy, but uh, an injection of insight into how you can tackle some of the challenges and opportunities facing you as an L&D leader. If you use this code, there's, a, there's some brochures. I run their small groups, four people only. I'm running two of them, so only eight people get to come along. Um, if you use the promo code guest may, um, you can come along for free, uh, and it, it'll just be a small peer-to-peer -peer group of L&D leaders. I'll be um, hosting, facilitating, holding the space, but everyone gets 10 minutes in the warm seat to bring a challenge or opportunity. I'll do a half hour prep session with you beforehand so we can shape up your challenge or opportunity really sharply. And the idea is you come away with some actionable insight uh, around something that you're working on in your organisation. So I'd invite you to take advantage of this. I run these back in Australia at time zones where you guys would normally be in bed normally. So I thought, while I'm over here, I'll run a couple of these. So you're very welcome uh, to join me for that. And there's some brochures around the room as well if you're interested in that. If you do book a place, I ask you, please show up. If you don't think you can show up, don't book a place because with only four people, if one person doesn't show up, it really does take away from that peer-to-peer -peer experience of um, sharing ideas, insights, suggestions uh, amongst the group. But it would be lovely to have some more, uh, more intimate time with some of you on the 10th of May if you're interested in that opportunity. And that brings me to Q&A, Nigel. Yep. So we've got um, about five minutes for Probably 30 questions in that time. <laughs> to talk quickly. <laughs> Has anyone got any, any points? N not necessarily questions. People might want to make a statement. Yeah, or... I'm open to that. Oh, there I am. Um, that was really good. Thank you. What do you advise as the kind of average shelf life of a strategy? Like <laughs> how, how often should you be, should you be refreshing it? Um, so I, I suggest, normally most strategies take around three years and we kind of horizon plan the actions, um, but I also suggest a quarterly review with your, your governance board um, and you evolve it as you go. And if something, you know, uh, really significant changes in your environment, you may need to do something, um, you know, more substantial, a bit of a more substantial overhaul. But once you've done it, if you've done it in this way, um, and you've done this listening, it won't take you as much time to refresh it next time round. But it's something it's not set and forget, right? Um, it's something you keep alive with you. You know, you have an evaluation plan and dashboard, you're reporting back to the governance board, looking at what's working, what's not working, gathering your stories and adjusting as you go. You, you may not need to do a major refresh for some time to come if you're kind of evolving it in that way. But three years um, is kind of typically how far out I ask people to look. I would say also nothing worse than a, an obsolete strategy that you're trying to knock along the road just because you've got it. Yeah. So have the courage to build it and then have the courage to destroy it if circumstances change. But yeah, I think that's called, a good point. Called, called and, and there's some real game changers out there at the moment, there right? I'm not going to say it, yeah, but yeah. there are some obvious game changers there out are. there. There are. Yeah. yeah. So you've got to have the courage to face that down. Yeah. OK, 
Okay, the, that may sound a bit like a weird question, but how would you build up learning strategy within learning strategy? Because there is somewhere that the learning strategy of the full company, but a department may need to also define its learning strategy and integrate it within the overall learning strategy. Um, so we're talking about the, the, the skill set, the capability of the L&D team itself? I just want to make sure I've understood the question. No, I'm any other sure department. Think. It could be like you any have... department. Yeah, it could be like the marketing. It could be like um, security and safety. It could so be a different. So sub-learning strategy, a yeah. departmental or divisional learning strategy. Yeah, and they have That's the full community, but it's not some... Yes, there is a part of div uh, building up the skills of the community, but maybe um, if we go outside of just thinking skill and competency, we can actually get them more savvy, make learning survey, and they can help. So it's like learning strategy, within learning strategy, that we all elevate everything. Yeah, well hopefully your learning strategy has the flexibility that, you know, it's not just about formal learning by a long stretch. Um, and you see, if it is these days, you've probably missed the mark. But talking about communities, enabling learning, building learning skills, um, there should be some flexibility. It should kind of be able, like within the actual way it's implemented, to flex. Um, with the Australian Public Service work that we did, um, we did a lot of testing of how much does this look like learning in your department, how much does the future vision we shape look like where you're headed, but we did a lot through the community of practice then for implementation and buy-in and shaping different things, and it was completely opt-in for their departments, but most of them have bought into it uh, and been able to interpret it and apply it in their environment. So you're testing for flexibility, and you need to be smart about where is localisation a great idea. It's because you could have a lot of cultural variation as well. The, the other thing is, Michelle, if you, if you put in another couple of personas, if someone says, it doesn't fit, we need separate one for... If you put a persona around that division or that True. department, that, they go, oh, yeah, that fits quite well. Yeah. So just be, be smart and don't, don't have 93 different learning strategies around the place because everyone wants... We want one. That's not going to work. It's just yeah. not going to work. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, you do. But People don't realise that they're generally a lot more common than they are different, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I think it's finding that commonality and uh, finding where, where you can accommodate people. And we did have with Orica, we had um, one, one persona that was very different from the rest and it was for that new digital area of the business, right? And we need to tackle it in different ways. But the, the strategy was flexible enough that they just leaned more into the knowledge sharing area, right? And that was more what they implemented more heavily in that area. Yeah. So we didn't need a new strategy, we just needed to emphasise a different part of the strategy for them. Yeah. Think of, think of Microsoft. Microsoft used to be a collection of completely warring divisions that thought they had nothing whatsoever in common. Even if they was a Mac office, Windows office, we ha hate each other, not going to talk to each other, fighting each other. And what they've done now is recognise, hey, we're all one company, we're better when we're together. So, you know, it, it, if you, t I'm maybe I'm talking completely out of, hand, uh, out, of t out of turn, but if you, if Microsoft created 73 learning strategies for each bit of Microsoft, you do untold damage. It's one, because we're, we're, we're working together. And so I think it's, it's part of a unifying process, not a separating process. That, I, uh, that if it works. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. And it's, it's, it's 5.02, yeah, Nigel. Yeah, there's probably about <laughs> only three bottles of beer left. <laughs> Qu quick finish. Michelle, if there's anyone in this room who hasn't understood more viscerally not only what a learning strategy is, but what it can be and how you do it, then where have you been for the last hour and 20 minutes? That was beautifully structured, excellently presented, and really helpful. So, Michelle, thank you so much for doing Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you everyone for sticking it right through to the end and out there will be the And beer. there are some extra copies of the guides towards the front here in yeah, seats. If anyone, if anyone, missed anyone out. wants to grab a resource, feel free. Uh, and I'm very happy if you're on LinkedIn, if you want to message me or anything like that with questions, just reach out.